Welcome to the uh, February work session. Let's get started. So first thing up is uh, comments from our student representative. Welcome tonight. Thank you. So I spoke about the TEDx event last weekend, which was a combination of speakers and workshops about millennials. And we were very grateful to be able to have the event, which was extremely successful for the first year. And we look forward to improving it in the future. Also, the high school is currently having a Jeans for Teens drive and a Tasty Cakes for Troops drive. And the student council is preparing for Mr. Gray Valley in the spring. And we look forward to the instrumental winter concert tomorrow night. Great. All right, great. Thank you. The basketball team had a tough defeat, I heard. Oh. Rough game. Rough game. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, the program is there for approval, all the course selections for next week. Would you want Stephen to bring, uh, highlight the new? Yes, that'd be a good idea. Uh, new... Dr. O'Toole will highlight some of the, the changes and additions just so to draw your attention to things that are different. Good evening. Most of the changes you'll see uh, can be summarized on page seven of the program of studies where We've had um, continued conversations, both myself, uh, Trisha Beck, and Marshall Hoffritz have been working with um, Mr. Flick uh, and Mr. Connors and Dr. Um, Capitola around providing additional opportunities for our students with regards to dual enrollment. So we've uh, begun a partnership and conversation with University of Pittsburgh, where they offer college in the high school. So you'll notice there are courses that are listed on page seven is basically where you see the dual enrollment options where we have uh, two computer programming courses, uh, introduction computer programming courses, as well as an introduction to matrices and linear algebra, which would be a course above uh, the AP BC calc for some of our students. They've been, as they've been looking to enroll in um, computer science majors, particularly even at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, they've been recommending uh, those types of courses. So that would be a, a course typically for students going into their senior year after they've taken BC Calc in their junior year versus um, an, a STAT course. But we also are increasing uh, the statistics level for uh, students to receive uh, dual enrollment. Um, one of the areas that we're constantly looking for with dual enrollment is en English, uh, looking for English opportunities. So we're continuing to explore options and we'll do that over the next few years, uh, even into next year. One of the challenges, as we have found when working with University of Pittsburgh, is that they've said that their English department typically does not want to uh, participate in a dual enrollment option. So we're looking for institutions that will, their departments, have to sponsor and allow for colleges, or excuse me, high schools to have dual enrollment within courses such as English. So, so that's an area that we're still exploring uh, and as well as looking at introductory courses for students so that they can receive dual enrollment. Another uh, addition is a partnership with Pitt Ohio uh, Transportation Company, which is actually, they have a terminal in Phoenixville where we're engaged in conversations with them to, for students who are 18 or older to consider uh, a career in the transportation industry. And what their uh, focus is really around local um, students within their uh, depot or their transportation unit in Phoenixville and then receiving an opportunity to have employment following that. So it's an internship. Uh, actually, it's more of an apprenticeship, paid apprenticeship uh, that would transfer into when they graduate from high school if they're looking at that into as a career. So, so we're having uh, continued conversations. That's that's the bulk of the any additions to the program of studies. Everything else is uh, relatively consistent from pre last year. I just want to um, acknowledge the, all of the hard work Dr. O'Toole and Mrs. Becker have been doing um, in getting these partnerships. Once the partnerships are more solidified with the University of Pittsburgh, we will have more of a formal announcement where they'd like to come. Um, the School of Medicine is also working with our teachers. And in adding these dual enrollment options, I just want to make it very clear, we are not adding any additional staff. The courses will be taught by existing staff and will be in lieu of other classes that had been offered in the past. So in light of the fact um, Although we're offering more opportunities for students, we are not increasing any staff positions to do that. So I really want to thank Dr. O'Toole and Mrs. Beck for their work mm -hmm. with the administrators in the, the buildings. Great. Thank you. Um, Stephen, I would like to, you know how I feel about partnerships. Um, dual enrollment is great. It's, this is huge. I'm really thrilled every time we, 
we bring back things like this. So again, that's awesome. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, the monthly enrollment report is there for review. How many more now, Chuck? Sounds good. All right, policy committee update. Okay, we had a policy committee meeting on February 6th at 7.30 in the morning. And I will briefly run through the policies that we talked about. Policy 919 was campaigning another political activity on district property. The policy was scheduled for first reading, but committee members asked for clarification. Dr. Gafredo revisited this policy with the solicitor who recommended the following language. The board of directors has the authority to, to suspend provisions of this policy or other policies pertaining to political activity under special circumstances when deemed to be in the best interest of the school community, provided that the board acts in a nonpartisan manner. And just as background of this, this, this the goal is to um, make it possible for Great Valley still to have political speakers. So for example, when um, President Obama was, before he was president, came to Great Valley to talk, um, under the policy as it was originally proposed, it wouldn't have been allowed, but with this provision, um, it would be allowed, provided that you also um, invite the, the opposite side as, as was done at the time. Um, there is always an issue with time constraints because in these situations, for example, with the President Obama situation, again, before he was president, um, everything kind of came down in less than a week, I'm gonna guess. So um, the committee <coughs> talked about this and um, we suggested that the authority be given to the superintendent or designee at the direction of the board because if we had to come back to the board and ask for permission, the opportunity might already be passed. So that's why that change is suggested. Um, so this policy is back for first reading. Um, policies 325, 425 to 525, dress and appearance and administrative guidelines for administrative professional and classified staff. Administrative guidelines were added to the policy. This addresses the subjects of promotion of freedom of religion and pol um, political advocacy. Um, while the district strives to create an environment of free expression, there are constraints regarding the promotion of personal views. The policy is being moved to first reading. So just to put this in plain English, um, you can still wear, for example, religious items around your neck, things like that, but the idea is that you shouldn't promote your religion um, by you know, inviting people to your church or things like that, um, or your synagogue or whatever, um, so that there's a difference between free speech and promotion in this setting. Policy 327, Management Team for Administrative Employees. The policy is being recommended to be repealed as other policies address the content of this one. Policy 328, Administrator Compensation Plan. Um, known as Act 93, the plan expires in 2020. At that time, position titles will be removed from the policy and replaced by just the general titles of those included in the plan. Um, this is just to make it easier for us to keep up on updates and make it more um, general. Policies 331, 431, 531, job-related expenses and administrative guidelines for administrative personnel and classified staff. Administrative guidelines were created for these policies. The prior policy contained no timeline. Now the guidelines state that requests for reimbursement of travel expenses must be submitted within 60 days of the date in which the expense was occurred. In incurred, sorry. Policies 333, 433, 533, professional development for administrative, professional, and classified staff. The name of this policy was changed from professional growth and tuition reimbursement. Professional development is a prerequisite for employees to maintain their certifications and undertake increased responsibility. Policy 533 was added to include classified employees in professional development opportunities. Policy 336, 436, 536, personal necessity leave for administrative, professional, and classified staff. This policy addresses the number of days approved for bereavement, personal necessity leave beyond that outlined in this policy, such as restrictions on when leave can be taken or other extenuating circumstances is governed under the applicable employee handbook. Um, the meeting adjourned at 8.05 a.m. And the next meeting of the policy committing is, the policy committee is scheduled for Tuesday, March 6th, the bright and early at 7.30 a.m. in district office. Questions about any of these? This, these were fairly straightforward, I would say. Um, the political one, um, I think, you know, might need revising as time goes on. And we, if, you know, just to kind of make sure it's flexible and represents what we want, but we did the best we could with it, so. 
but I, I expect that there might be things that we haven't thought of or situations that, you know, that we need to talk about later. So just putting that in your heads that. All right, thank you. So there's also in there uh, that section um, policies for second reading and adoption. So those will be voted on next week, Tuesday. And then um, first reading are the ones that Steph just went over for next month for voting on. And there's also one for rescinding, so. All right, facilities. Anything? Yeah, meetings tomorrow night. Meetings tomorrow night, mm -hmm. there you go. And the building use report is there. Uh, nothing under transportation or food service. So we'll jump into finance. And report from the finance committee meeting. Ellen, you filled in, so. I did. I filled in for Phil Frey, our treasurer. Uh, the board finance committee met on February 5th. The superintendent and business manager reviewed the current <laughs> status of the budget. The board requested some additional information for tonight, that being demographic information and additional information on the per pupil expenses. Tonight, the superintendent and business manager will review this information. The board also requested that our pupil services director present in March on special education costs. Um, if, if there's anybody, I, I know there were some other things that we had discussed at the uh, committee meeting um, that did not get included because of it was at the committee meeting. So um, I would like to, to discuss something else that I'd like to see. Um, I'm really concerned about the cost of the budget increasing, especially given the climate with our um, legislation that's already been passed, legislation that's coming up, um, legislation that's been passed that we don't really understand. I think to continually increase our budget, if that's what we had to do to, to remain 10th in the state of Pennsylvania, I'd be all for it. I don't believe that um, we have to continuously increase our budget to remain 10th. I think in the last 60 years that, that this district has been installed, or however many that is, I think we've done an exemplary job becoming who we are. We have always been on the cutting edge. We've had some phenomenal superintendents that have always, always been forward thinking and added where we needed to add, but in my six and a half years on this board, although this administration works tirelessly um, to, to balance things, I don't believe we've done an adequate job of assessing what we are still providing as choices compared to what we are adding to remain 10th. So I would really like to have a little discussion among my colleagues. I hope you can support me in this. I would really like to take the deep dive as to having the administration look at, okay, we know we don't want to take every budget cut out of special education, but we know we have to cut. We, we cannot sustain this organization and remain 10th in the state um, by continually adding to this budget. So I would really like to discuss us um, looking at and taking that deep dive, looking at programs that maybe we've used since um, the 60s and 70s that, that may not be appropriate right now. Anybody want to add in? I will chime in. I will say, um, as a new board member, um, I won't go so far as to say that we need to cut, but I need to understand what comprises the budget to feel good about the numbers that we're asking our community to help support. So I support the idea of a, um, a more thorough understanding, at least for myself, of what comprises the, the money that we spend each year. So what would you like to see from that? Because what she's proposing is, I think, taking out X number of dollars out of the budget and what would that mean? And you're kind of proposing more from the other side of what does it all mean? 
So now let me clarify. I'm not talking about taking anything out of the budget, nor am I even considering taxation. What I'm saying is that I think we are at a point if if I'm interpreting my job responsibilities as an elected school board official. Um, we, I think, are at a point where we have to look at what do we need to be who we want to be. This community wants us to be 10th in the state of Pennsylvania or better. What do we need to do that? And I think we need to look at what we can let go of that we don't need. It's not about dollars and cents or making a benchmark. It's about assessing what we have spent in the past that we may not need to be spending today. Oh, there we go. Um, just for transparency, I, I kind of think it's useful to have these programs for our community. And then when we have, we, we get emails about taxes and increases like that, I'd love for our community to know what programs we're not cutting um, and that people think about. So maybe we'd get more interest in the community and in saving and making sure we continue to, to support these programs if we were even talking about them. Can I ask a clarifying question? Are people interested in what like courses can be cut, for example, from the course catalog if there was an emergency? Or when I think of like ways to cut money and I don't want to start a panic because I 100% do not support this for various reasons, um, easiest ways to cut money, get rid of kindergarten, get rid of busing. I don't think it should be done, but that's classic. I've seen it in other districts. I've, you know, grew up with it in New York. Those were the discussions that we were having. Um, or are we interested in, in saying, and I'm, I'm pulling this out of the air, but, you know, say that there was a class on basket weaving that we've offered since baskets were invented and we founded this great school. And are we saying, okay, now we think that the trend should be cybersecurity or rockets and we want to get rid of basket weaving. Is that what we're looking at her to do, or are we looking at her to just say, yes, let's cut busing, which I don't think should be done? If you're asking me for clarification, I am agreeing with you 100%. Exactly your interpretation. Let's look at basket weaving. Basket weaving was popular 35 years ago. I don't necessarily know that it's popular today. We, there are things that we may be able to do without that we once um, utilized. So I, I just think it's a, it's a look. And even to just, if we'll use basket weaving as the example, maybe, maybe basket weaving stays, but what are we trading off to keep basket weaving? I don't, it's not a judgment call on anything that's in the budget, but rather just an understanding of what comprises the money that we spend and making sure everybody feels good about the fact that we're spending it. I, I worry, and I'm coming from a background heavily invested in science, math, I worry that the easy answer is going to be, cut, to be cut more of the arts classes. And I feel like that would be a mistake. So I don't know how you're going to come up with what to recommend, um, but I, I like having a diversity of offerings so that all students can find paths which bring out their natural talents. I think the, the whole reason is just to bring in discussion. So if we're not discussing cutting the arts or cutting sports or cutting home ec or whatever, then people don't know that these are things that can go away. Um. Yeah, I'm not raising this discussion with an interest of cutting anything. I'm raising this with the interest of understanding how we spend our money. So is, is to give something concrete, is this saying, and I'm, I'm just trying to narrow her job down because there's so many other things going on that I hate to see time wasted is our goal to say, look at the course catalog and pick 2% of the classes that you think that Great Valley could live without and still have a great reputation? Or are there any classes? In, like, what are we asking her to do just to narrow focus? What I would like, what I'm asking you all to support is, I would like the administration to take a look at everything we offer and to decide what we can live without. I'm not saying what we can cut, I'm saying what we can live without based on the 21st century and what it takes to make us 10th in the state of Pennsylvania. So in other words, we'll go back to basket weaving. Basket weaving was top 10 35 years ago. It's not today. What, what about, see, this, I'm not trying to be a pain, but like, is she supposed to look at busing? I'm gonna pick on busing. Or extracurricular or? Sports. 
I mean, I, I don't, I don't want the people on the tax team to come down. No, I, and New York. I appreciate it. And you know what? I appreciate it. And we do need to do a better job at letting them, giving them direction. I think what they need to do is to come back with our mission in mind. What is in the best interest of children? I don't believe that it's necessarily in the best interest of children to offer 75 things if they don't need them. I don't believe that's in the best interest. I would expect this, that, this administration, especially because I just so know where they are, to come back here and say, this is who Great Valley is. I know this is who you wanna, you wanna stay, and this is what we're going to have to do to bring that about. That's so should she be looking at things like busing? She should be looking at whatever she feels is in the best interest of the children and what completes the community mission. And the community mission is, we want to be 10th in the state. If she believes that keeping a million dollars in, and she, and I'm sorry, that's a terrible thing. If Regina and the administrators believe that they want to spend $4 million and dissect pork bellies instead of putting a million dollars into special ed, I would expect that they would come back here because that's what they felt was in the best interest of our kids. I don't believe that, I believe we're going to get the right thing, but I do believe we have to do the work. And in the six and a half years I've been sitting here, we have talked about this. Our community members have been trying to convince us that maybe we need to look in this direction. And we've had these dialogues. We've just never pushed off of that ledge. I do believe that we need to now look at everything we have and what we spend money on and what is, what, how do we move forward based on the economic constraints that we know are coming. So I'm, well, I'm still confused. And so if I were her, I would be wondering like, Am I supposed to think about cutting sports, like just keeping varsity and getting rid of, like I have no clue what she's going to come back with. So whatever Dr. Speaker Palbinski comes back with, I could criticize because I can't picture it in my head. Now she may have a vision, but I'm saying this is like an impossible. Yeah, I think it's too wide thing. open because even one person's understanding of what's needed or required. I mean, I understand we're relying on the administration, but still, I mean, if if we have courses that 20 kids are taking, is that needed? Because well, it satisfied 20 kids' needs? Well, let, let me that ask, let me ask so you. So it's so wide open of what you've asked for. Uh, uh, well, like we but see, do we need a one-to-one -one device thing? Like, no, like kids have lived without it, but it does advance us in her opinion. But you could have a board member up here saying this is absolutely not necessary. We are fine with tablets. We are giving Moses. Let's stick with that. Yeah, but this is this is giving direction. So here's the thing: we do this. We rely on this administrative team to come to us at budget time and say, "This is how I'd like to increase this budget. This is we believe we need to increase this budget by five million dollars, and this is what we think we need." Okay, and we we watch the presentation. I want to know what don't we need. Because I know in the last 60 years that this district has been serving kids that we have not let go. We see it every year. I've sat here for almost seven years. We add, we add, we add. We do not proportionately or disproportionately remove, remove, remove. Or if we do, the administration isn't doing a good job of telling us that. So it might be that you are internally balancing all the time and we just don't feel that internal balance. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, so you may have already removed basket weaving from the curriculum at the high school, but because what you, what, at least what I see is the curriculum guide for the high school, I don't necessarily go line by line and compare them year to year. And I don't believe that that is something that I should need to do. So it might be that there might, if there are other needs that we have because we are required to fund special ed, there, because there are so many other mandates that you're saying these are the things that we have to have, that how are we rebalancing to make sure that, because we knew, for an example, we knew that um, in the tech department that robotics 
what was becoming much more of an issue because we had an enormous waiting list. We knew that in the middle school they had a program where you either picked language or you picked uh, picked a different language, you picked English remediation. There was a different things in there. And kids were getting their first, second, or third choice. And we said, hey, how are we looking at that? For me, that's what I'm thinking of. How are we be, re how are we rebalancing internally to make this make sense? And are we rebalancing? Because perhaps you are doing that. For me, I would for me on a different note, I would like to know are we delivering services in the best educational and economic manner. Like we had, we used to have block scheduling at the high school. And we said, hey, you know what? This isn't functioning the way that we thought that it was going to. Have we looked at the team teaching in the middle school? Have we looked at some of those other educational methods that we do and say, this is the best educationally and financially? Or do we say, we've always had team teaching at the high school, so we're going to keep doing that. And I'm not suggesting, it's just one that came to mind right now, that is that the best educational and economic way to look at that, or does that have unintended consequences with other things like building use and, you know, like, do, does it make the most sense still? Just because we've been doing it for 20 years, should we keep doing it for another however many? For me, it's more that kind of, because I, I, do, I do feel that thing about how the budget comes down, but we never hear that rebalance. So I, I would like to be very specific. No, that's okay. that's no, I just want to clarify. So what I'm looking for is <coughs> what can we cut that we do not need? That is what I'd like to see. And I'd like that to, I'd like that everybody but I, could But I don't that. know what that means, Ellen, because I, like, I, don't, I, I don't know, like when I drove my kids a lot to school because they were in before school activities, I don't really need busing. So for me, they could cut busing, but the district might need, like I don't know yeah, to tell her that, that's, that's another conversation. She's paid, the administrators are paid to do a job. Well, just let, follow me through. Wait, wait, no. but you're, you're making the assumption that what's been proposed in the budget is things that there's things in there we don't need. And in fairness, I don't know if that's No, I'm asking to do the work to tell me whether there are things in that budget that we do not need. Can that's I, what I'm asking. Can we hear from the superintendent for a little bit just to catch up on her thoughts, please? Uh, well, I can begin by saying, um, which is why when Stephen presented the program of studies, we are adding courses and not adding staff to teach those courses, which means that previously taught courses are no longer going to be taught because courses that are more necessary to meet the needs of our kids are going to be taught. So that's one thing right out of the gate. The other thing with the program of studies, students sign up. And in the past, we have not been, up until last school year, very adamantly looking at class sizes at the high school. So if not enough students sign up for a, a class, this, the course does not run, and then that child gets second course. So just because courses are listed in the program of studies, that's not a guarantee that that class will actually be offered, because it's dependent upon how, how many students sign up for that class. So those kinds of things are happening, and I need to do a better job of helping, of making sure I'm communicating that piece clearly. The problem with any administrator deciding and as you found in the last of the conversation of the last 10 minutes, it becomes a value judgment. And when you make a value judgment, you have to understand that you're using your values to make that judgment. So if we really, um, Mrs. Gunderson's example of cutting transportation, if we go back to Mrs. Burrell's comment about serving the needs of children, there will be a population of students that will not be able to access the edu educational program that we offer because they cannot get there to access it. Could we cut it? We absolutely could. Um, students with disabilities, we have to provide them with transportation, so we would have to continue to do that, but those students without a plan, they would be left to their own devices. Um, that would be a value judgment of me saying that if parents wanted their child to get to school badly enough, they could find a way to do that. And you so, would get a huge increase in parents like me requesting that our students be evaluated <laughs> for a disability so that they could get a ride. Which is some of the things that happen because of that. It's an unintended consequence of, of policy. So um, I, I believe I can definitely come back and tell you those things that are not as heavily utilized if that's a decision that the board would like to um, 
to become a part of and, and, and better understand. Um, we are de redeploying staff to make sure we're maximizing the use of staff in, in ways that they hadn't been before, which we talked a little bit about um, at our meeting last week. We'll continue to do that. I'm very hesitant to make drastic changes that will um, end up being long-term. The implications end up being more expensive. So that's, I will always share with you the implications of any chance, any choice we make um, or any decision that we make. I'm going <clears> to <throat> wear my new girl hat for as long as I can. Um, and I think Brian made a good point earlier about transparency and education f for us and for the community. And I think the, the chart that um, we projected last week that had the three columns, I'll go from, from right to left. Right was special education, middle was pension, left was like everything else. That was really informative for me. Um, there was also sort of an aha moment as we talked about special education costs. We said, oh yeah, well special education transportation actually falls in that far, far left category, but we didn't count it as special education costs. So that left side bucket that maybe at first blush looks discretionary, it's, it's really not. And I don't know, I'm not suggesting that there's things in that bucket that can or have to be cut. I just want a better understanding of what's in that bucket so I understand how it all comes together. And that might not be a report that we need from you. It might just be more homework that I have to do on my own, but that's, that's what I'm hungry for, is a better understanding of what's in that left-hand column. And I think that's a great point, and it is something that we should not only share with you, but to share with the public so that there's a better understanding. And that is something I completely understand and can deliver on. Um, I, the the um, voluminous um, undertaking of, of making a value judgment of what we can get rid of, um, I can certainly provide information and we can put a price tag on some of the things we offer and then that can be a conversation. So I do have a tendency, I know I'm dim sometimes and I'm gonna take the dim girl right now. <laughs> you make a value judgment building the budget every year. Superintendents and administrators make value judgments building that budget information. What's the difference between looking at and making a determination of what we can do without using the exact same lens that you guys build the budget with? I'm not, I'm, I'm not being snide. I'm truly having a problem understanding this. If you build a budget subjectively based on your best determination as to how f up for Great Valley to remain 10th, why can't you make the same value judgment assessing all of the program and telling us what can be cut because we don't need it? I, I'm, uh, I'm missing this. If, if I can jump in for a second, I mean, and Regina, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've heard you say this before. You did suggest what you thought was best for Great Valley to keep them tense. That is the budget that she suggested. Then we came back and said, okay, so now here's our value judgment saying we don't want to spend quite as much money. She's already given us her value judgment. So now the question is how do we move forward between where we want to be economically and what she's saying it requires to keep us tense. I believe that that is unless I'm misunderstanding something, that that's really where we're stuck. And part of the problem now is we have to say to her, these are the things that we do or do not value. Because she's already said the things that she believes that sh are, should be valued because they're already in the budget. So now if we want to take things out, it's on us. But we but rely on her. No, I would like Regina to answer that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. That is in, is in fact true, and when I was when you had made it clear that you wanted to reduce the budget, I came back and said it would only be fair. And I know that that was not a popular response, but if we are suggesting, a, for example, a psychologist, which is not um, that was that was one of the items in the budget, if we do not hire a psychologist, we'll continue to contract out those services that go over and above the allowable number of evaluations or the, the ability of the current psychologists we have. So we will contract those. So I don't believe it would be, it. I will not hold off information I will share with you. Just like if I'm asked to look at programs that we can get rid of, I will share with you if we don't, if we no longer offer this program, these are the implications of that decision. I think that's only, 
an intelligent way to make decisions to understand the implications. And then we know the decision that we're making. So that is exactly the budget that we promoted. I, there are many programs that are offered within the district that some of them have been traditional programs. And we can certainly go back to the very, but I think we're, we'll be starting from looking at everything we offer, elementary, middle school, and high school. And if we want to, as we talked last week, what's discretionary and what's not discretionary, you have a whole lot more discretionary capability than, than was defined. I think a, a percentage was given out. You have a lot more discretion, but then you have to make those judgments. Transportation is a big one. That's, that's an example of a large discretionary object or line item. Is it fair to say that um, based on the request for using the psychologist as an example, we were, there was a request for a new psychologist. We said sharpen the pencils. Based on all of the possible trade-offs, the best possible alternative to that would be to contract out the psychologist's work as opposed to anything else that could be traded off. The, tra the best trade-off decision would be contracting that work instead of hiring. Yes, because one of the things that we're, we wanted to do with that school psychologist, in the large picture, you want to cut down the number of referrals to special education. So you want to build a child study team, which is happening in many of our buildings. So this is much more information than you've asked for, but it's happening in many of our buildings now. But it's very difficult for people who are already their plates are already full to oversee that process. So it's being proactive and putting the resources in the pre-referral process rather than putting the, the resources in the after the identification process. So when Dr. Wexler presented with Dr. O'Toole, I believe that was in November, and gave a very deep dive on special education and explained the process we're in place about the child study team, in order to make that happen, we need resources to do that. If we're saying we don't have the resources right now to do that, that's fine. We'll continue to use psychologists for evaluations, but we won't be able to beef up our pre-referral system, which is how you do it in the long-term bigger picture. Does that make sense, Ellen? I'm, I'm it, it, it does make sense, Regina, but it, it so reeks to my point. So we get a budget that says the need for this um, this employee is not just to do evaluations, it's to actually create a, to, to create an environment where we now can, can foster trust, whatever we have to do to make our costs in, in special education less, meaning people will give up IEPs, they trust us, we don't have 70 PCAs anymore. Okay, that was the intention, is that right, of that person. So we get the budget slide and the board says, we need to sharpen the pencil. That, that was a great idea you had, that will build special ed to the point where it will actually cost us less money and our compliance will, will actually be better. When we say sharpen the pencil and the slides come back, that person is taken out. Now it's down to we're going to farm out our um, we're going to we're going to farm out our evaluations, which isn't even what the purpose of that item was. So I know I'm confused, but I the only way I see of, of solving my confusion is to say to you. What are we paying for and providing? within the confines of what we do that we actually do not need because we're not looking at that. We're looking at slides from one week to the next. We're not saying, as you just said a couple minutes ago, there are things that, that you know are outdated that, that we could be doing that are outdated. I'd like to know what they are. If it is up to us, didn't you? I thought you did, I'm sorry. Maybe it was wishful thinking, I'm sorry. <laughs> But, but then you come back to us and say, okay, based on who I am and my best guess in as an educational professional, 
I believe we could actually do without this, 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 and this, and then the board decides whether they want to make any changes, take anything out, or not. We may decide, no, we don't want to get rid of anything, but unless we see from you what those options are based on your best guess and our mission, how can we continue to do this work? All right, so maybe <clears throat> I think the problem is it's so wide open. I think if you really want to see because what we've heard from Virginia is that this is what they believe is needed at this level to maintain what we have in Great Valley, okay? And if we as a board want to say, what would it look like without $1 million? And what programs would have to go? If that's the way to approach this, maybe that's the way to do it. And what would it mean if we took out $2 million? Maybe, I mean, that's maybe what we do. And then she can come back to us with, okay, if you want a million dollars out, that will mean X. And that may mean busing, that may mean tiddlywinks, that may mean, I hate to say anything else because I'll get in trouble. Okay. But any other program, right? But <clears throat> then as a board, we can decide, are those things worth whatever money it takes to fund them or not, right? And there are certain things that we can't get rid of. I mean, we all know that, special ed, core classes and everything. Is that a better way to approach this, I think? So maybe maybe a different way to approach this is that we need to be more educated on the, uh, we always talk about taking a 50,000 foot view, but maybe we need to take a slightly lower view so that you can get a sense of what, because I think if you just say, it, it's easy to say if you take a million out, you just cut something, right? But, but the, or whatever, or, but then you don't get the other side of whatever it is, which is, okay, so there's the psychologist that we really believe is important. So maybe the answer, maybe the first step is that we need to take a deeper dive into understanding parts of what it, you know, because obviously we're not going to cut English, right? Like English is, but if, it, are there nuances to things that, we need to understand so that we can so that we can either have a greater understanding of how we're spending our dollars or say, you know what, I understand that you think that this might be really important. What do you think the unintended consequences would be if we don't have this? And that, okay, this is something we want to try or not try. I mean, we, we did this a while ago when we eliminated um, foreign language at the elementary school level. It's not anything, I mean, if we all had unlimited funding, I think we would all want it to be there, but it, it couldn't be there because of the budget. But I think that trying to understand those pieces, I think, is crucial, and we've, we've not ever really done that. And also, too, it, it, that doesn't, you know, the, the greater <laughs> problem is increasing the budget in the school district year after year. That's the greater problem. So you can just keep adding. It's like ha having things in the closet. You can just keep throwing things in the closet and close the door. It just gets harder and harder to close the door. We are in a position, our job, as I see it anyway, is to, con is to, is to, to oversee a sustainable structure for education. And when you, all you do is add, Without, just, just let me finish, without doing the balance of looking at what is no longer necessary. It's like when I went to high school and I graduated in 1974, I had curlers this big that I put in my hair. Well, now in, in 2018, I don't use those curlers, so I threw them away. But, but we don't do I, that. But I don't know that we don't do it. We might be doing it, and they're just not reporting it. That's why I'm asking for that. Well, account. but we're still adding. The way I know that it's not being done, and, and this is not detrimental to anybody, but... It's a math equation. We're still increasing our budget by $6 million from one year to the next. Yeah, but there's so, some things, Ellen, that are going to increase whether you try to balance or not. Special ed costs are going to go up. You want to add and, and not cut English? It's going to go up. And I agree, but I think we All need right. to do the exercise right. to show us where that is. Yep. I, and that's what I'm saying. I think the best approach is if we start peeling stuff off, what do those costs mean? And you're absolutely right. If, if it's... If we peel off a million, we really need a psychologist because it's going to save us $3 million in costs down the road because of special ed, due diligence, due process, or whatever. Um, then that's fine, too. But we need to know those gives and takes, right? Yes. So is that...
clearer? I can come back and give you that information. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, shy of, shy of cutting basket weaving, because I right. like it. We want baskets. All right. Thank you. We also bear some of this responsibility as a board, too, because we are we're currently in contract negotiations. Our largest cost under that budget is a teacher's contract, retirements, health care, all of those things. So, you know, we as a board, you know, as much as we're asking Regina to do her work, um, which is to be expected, um, we also need to make sure that we as a board get a contract that's also sustainable and that we are pursuing something that makes sense for the school district. I mean, we hear numbers, we see presentations, we hear pe people talking from the microphone, but the reality is, is that we do have highly compensated employees in the school district. Um, we need to bring all those costs under control, and that's, you know, that, that requires a concerted effort from the school board. I mean, the healthcare costs alone, if you were to say, come up with a million dollars, you know, if you negotiate the right terms for healthcare into a contract, that, that could easily close that gap. So it's, there, there, there's a lot that's at play here, but, you know, we also need to stand fast as a board to ensure that we are approaching this in a way that makes sense economically. Because again, we chuck what that's 70, 80% of the budget right there, teacher's contract, we t teacher's contract, the comp, healthcare and retirement. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the bulk of it right there. And I think we need to, to, to look at that as well as, as to approaching this in a way that actually makes sense economically. So, um, you know, we can talk about cutting, um, but again, what is that going to look like? The cost isn't tied up in the contract. So th th those are just my, my thoughts. And, 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 I, and I heard some comments up here from the board, which I, I find a, a little disconcerting in the sense that we have done this before. Um, we sat in auditoriums, we went through the budget, we went through the budget line by line, that was 2007, 2008. Um, so we have looked at this before, but you know, maybe it is time that we start to look at this again um, with fresh eyes um, in 2018, um, maybe you know, a decade later or less, eight years later. Um, again, just because things have changed. I mean, I'm a strong advocate for this you know, 21st century education, but you know, at, at what cost? Um, and, and what does that education look like that's being delivered in a way, again, that's economically sound that we're actually educating our students? You know, is cutting kindergarten the right thing to do? We've debated this issue before. Um, it's something that could be done. Um, you know, is it the right thing to do? Is cutting sports the right things to do? I mean, you could, you could take a draconian approach with that and say, we're just getting rid of, rid of sports and all those costs are gone all of a sudden and, and we take all of our efforts and resources and drive it truly into education and let people pursue sports outside of the school district. I mean, there's many different ways to do it, but again, we need, we need to approach this with, with some level of reason. So um, as you're looking at these things, Regina, um, you know, please, please use some reason. Um, and I think that's kind of what we're asking you um, and, and we're kind of just basically tasking you with not to come back with, you know, if, if it really is cutting a million dollars, just get rid of bus. And that to me is not, um, it's an approach, but I think we're looking for something a little bit, a little bit more meaningful than that. So I hope that's not what we come back with, and, and I don't expect it to be next week as we continue on. So those are just my thoughts. All right. You have a presentation, Chuck. <laughs> yeah. Wait, can I clarify one question, Dave? Can you summarize for me what we're asking, Regina? Please. Yeah, we asked her to take a look at, I think, make sure I said this right, to take a look at. Or she can summarize if that's easier, but I thought we could tell her just to make sure that we're all clear. My understanding is you'd like to see what the budget would look like, a million dollars less, and then a second um, variation with $2 million less. That's my understanding, with the implications of what that would look like. I guess. I mean, if that's how it comes out, I, I, I that's guess. That's fine by me. I think if you, again, if you want to work into that, if we get the right, right health care negotiations and the right terms into a contract, what that would look like. You know, some type of a little bit of give and, give and pull on that. So we're not just going in targeting classes and programs and we're just getting rid of it. You know, if we say, hey, listen, if we get, get the teachers to agree to this and, and that, that gives us a million too, 
That to me is that's a rational presentation that makes sense. Um, I, I know we've done this in the past, and I, I don't want to belabor the point, but it, constantly just cutting is, is not always going to be the answer. The, the cutting is 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 in the bulk of the cost because again, we add people to the contract that adds retirement, that adds PESERS, that adds all those other fun things in healthcare. You know that that's I, I honestly think that's that's the goal we should be focusing on. There are I'm sure that there are programs, and again I don't have the the depth of experience with some of the other members of the board with with kids in the school district and, and knowledge of what is and, and is not really up to date with programs. That's obviously that's a that's a decision you have to make, Regina. But other than that, I would like to see that. You know, if we get the right insurance, health insurance program, how much that could save the school district and what that means overall with, with regard to the budget. So, and I can certainly offer that. The the reality, and I just want to make sure I'm clearly <coughs> transparent with this, is I can propose what that would look like, and just as I did with uh, best information and calculated retirements last year, and it was completely erroneous. So I can say this is what it would look like if that, in fact, is the negotiated deal with the association when the board negotiates the contract with the association, and, and that's a potential that's what it would come in at a budget. I have absolutely no guarantee, and I'm very hesitant to budget something of which I have no control. All the more important that we take a look at what we do have control over, which is our programs, um, anything else we provide student-wise. I think it's even, it's doubly important that we look because we can control that. Is it I think Phil's just saying that if, if and I, I, I can definitely 100% that it's outside of your control, as a matter of fact, it's more in our control, but if we did X, what would it mean? Mm -hmm. right. Absolutely. right, not saying that you're committing to that by yeah. any means, because like, you, like Phil pointed out, it's actually the nine of us that are negotiating with the teachers union, not you, so it's more that one's more in our ballpark than yours, so. And I think it's, it, sorry, excuse me, eight. I would, um, I'd be more interested in, and I don't know what the actual numbers are. I want to like go on record. I'm not saying I need you to cut a million dollars from our budget. That's not it. I'd like to say if we wanted to come down in the budget, here's $300,000 worth of programs that comprise the pieces of the budget that this board collectively makes decisions about what to include in our programming and what not to. And if among those $300,000 worth of expenses, you have a recommendation about which are the most enriching to the experience of a Great Valley education, that's useful information for us to have. Maybe we wind up after that conversation saying, yeah, there's really not a whole lot to cut. Or maybe as a result of that discussion, we come up with a more efficient or effective or a new idea about how to accomplish some of the same enriching outcomes that we have as a result of the way we accomplish it today. That's where I'm going. And where, where I'd like to leave the perception for everyone is, I'm, I've never believed for one second that the administration isn't doing this because to be honest, I'm not a paid educational professional. I'm a board member. But we as a board have work that we need to do that I am relying on information from you to do. You could have been doing it all along. I don't know that. But in order for me to make an informed decision, which is what I was elected to do, I need to see this. So in, in, at no time did I do I really believe that there's anything that isn't being done, I just, in order for me to do it, I need to have you guys come back with it, so. And I'm just gonna put a quick plug in as head of facilities to say, because I know that there are some people that are looking at some other things with the debt service and things that we have not been funding our capital and that I don't want to see, we're gonna take a much deeper dive, I know tomorrow night into the budget, but I don't wanna see capital, um, I don't want to say improvements because it's not necessarily an improvement, like we need a roof, <laughs> you know, the, the, the things that we have to do to keep the buildings functional suffer because we're trying on the, because we're trying to rob Peter to pay Paul, because we are going to hit points where we have to put a roof on and we have to put new boilers on and we have to do those things and we have not been putting money, much money, we have been putting a little bit back. Cause I well, don't. I wouldn't. But I want to make sure that we don't, we don't rob Peter to pay that Paul. Well, I think we we also have to be careful that we don't constrain what we've asked for because in reality, the definition is the roof's not leaking 
per se today, and th it may be a, a decision that nine of us make that that makes more sense to put that off a year and keep tiddlywinks and basket waving right in place, right? That's just a decision. I just and wanna, I understand your opinion, but that is a I decision. I just want to make sure that we make, make some, I do, and yeah. I get that, but I want to make sure that we do some long-term planning because our long-term planning right now is just not today. Our long-term planning right now is manana, and it scares yeah, me a little bit. We don't want to be kicking the side. can down the road, no doubt, but we got to understand. Yep. All right, let's move on. I think hopefully there's pretty clear direction. Mm -hmm. Well, mine will be really quick. Um, Regina and I put together a presentation tonight based on the stuff we thought you asked for last week. Um, <laughs> it was asked for last week, right? It okay. was. Yeah, okay. Just make it was. So um, um, just some, some information that was asked for. Um, we'll work on this. I, um, I will tell you, it's all about staffing because, you know, most of the budget numbers that I have direct responsibility for in maintenance and transportation and all, they are generally drilled right down to the dollar. So, you know, unless you want to eliminate that kind of program, and we could stop heating the building. You're all right, right? It's not that bad today, right? <laughs> High school's warm. I am all sweatshirt. No electricity, so it's okay. So it's, you know, there is few. I, I mean... Um, just want to go over this things. This is all in your presentation here. Here's kind of the countywide. We are the highest. Op this is the operating cost per pupil. It's kind of the most fair presentation because it shows generally what, and we still are number one, um, shows what we spend per pupil in relation to everybody else. It's kind of second in the county. Is Phoenixville is a surprise, uh, but you can see that. Uh, just to show you where some of our numbers kind of uh, where we're, we're it gets to be that high. Um, our special ed cost per pupil is the highest in the county also. Um, and second place is, is Coatesville, followed by Westchester. So just example. So in this chart, the right-hand side is the actual per pupil, which is purely a number-driven, what we actually spent divided by our actual number of students that year. And the, on the left is a percentage of your operating budget. So if, if you have your total operating expenses. So you can see while we're first in per pupil, we're not really first in operating expenses, but that's just a percentage. Most of those other districts, Coatesville has a very high budget, but they also spend a lot more um, as is a this, percentage of your budget on. Is this special education cost per any pupil or special it's education cost per, per, per pupil receiving special education? 4,000 whatever. Yeah. Is so it, what? But this is for all students, not just the population of special yeah, ed students? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, Chuck, can I ask you a question? Is there, I know there's a lot of things um, that are interspersed within other line items in the budget. For instance, my understanding is the cost of busing for any special ed agreements is in with the busing costs and not with the special education costs. Is that right? Right. And that's way with every other school district too. So. Okay. But then there's other costs. Anything else we spend like PCAs, they're on the contract services line and not well, the PCAs special. PCAs would be included in this line. They're in in this orders. line. Okay. Are there other, are there other items other than contracted, um, um, transportation that would be in other line items other than yeah they cherry pick all over the place I mean it's it's everywhere it's 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 uh, like a cobweb no I mean in our budget so yes in all budgets in all school saying... budgets psychologists are not in special ed in all budgets your your attorney fees including special ed attorney fees and any settlements are not in special ed um, so transportation is not in special ed so then, okay, so then there really is no way without taking every little teeny tiny piece of money to know exactly what our special ed costs really are. Right. Okay, thanks. Uh, but in fairness, it's it's a relative to everybody else. Yes. This is this relative is, to everybody else. Right. So nobody else's transportation costs are in this. Nobody else's psychologist should be in this. I mean, somebody could miss code and put something in there. You know, no one else's uh, legal stuff could be in this. Uh, 
this is our regular ed cost per pupil. We are, we are first in this two. Um, TE is a really close second to us in, in regular ed cost, and Phoenixville is a sneaky third. So uh, just to show you, and as a percentage of our operating budget, um, we're actually on the low side of average on that as some spend more, some spend less. Vocational ed, we talk about that a lot. Um, and this is just one, one of the areas in our budget. We're, we are actually at the bottom of this one because we have very few students go to vocational ed. However, I will tell you there is one kind of hidden cost that's not in this number because it's a regular ed number. Um, which we are working on, it, it will be a, a, a big, um, one of the bigger adjustments we can make is we, we have the, the uh, part of the intermediate unit budget is they charge us for academic courses that we send students to at the vocational technical school. Now what happens is a kid, we pay a kid for a kid to go half time to learn a skill, whatever it is, basket weaving, tiddlywink throwing, whatever we're training them. You know, it's, it's this stuff, it's automotive, it's chef, it's all that stuff. If we send them over there without them having certain academic courses, phys ed, social studies, health, they pull them out of that course or that shop course, that tech course, and they give them this. So you would think, oh, that would be just all part of your half-time charge you go to the tech school for. No, they charge us on top of that. So in addition to the tech school budget that we have of, of over a million dollars for, for 45 kids, um, we also have about $184,000 of regular education. And I, when I say regular education, I don't mean to demean this. It's, the, it's kind of the almost the elective type education. The, the education is kind of ancillary. It's not the drilled in math. It's not this and that. So see, this, this is the type of stuff that I would love to be able to cut. Because I think that the CCIU can be super, super tricky, and I think they're minting this money over there. Well, very honestly, this is being cut as of 1819 without, this will be the $183,000 or $187,000. 184321 but I'm not Will be shared um, as a cut. That will be part of the definitely going to happen. And I have to thank high school administration because they've already started talking about how we're going to make sure our students get those courses. Quite frankly, we were paying 0.5. We were paying on a variable of time and being charged on a variable of course. And when that was exposed, I believe that was in October, we made it very clear that that is not happening again. Um, so with the recalculation, that is happening. The high school, I believe, Dr. O'Toole is meeting with the high school administration next week to make sure our students get those academic classes in their home school. Because quite frankly, it's not in the best interest of kids to be pulled from a shop that they're paying that we're paying for for them to get for 0.5 of the day um, to be pulled out for academics that should be taught in their home school. So that is definitely that's the beginning of the million dollar savings. I, I, I wish that we could have a citizen committee chaired by Bruce Chambers looking at the CCIU. <laughs> that would be my wish because there's a lot there. It's, it's just a, saying it's a cult over there and. Anyone that goes there gets swallowed up into it. So, I think there would be few who'd be able to resist. Mm. So, just to kind of drill down on some other areas, I picked out <coughs> maintenance cost per pupil. We are not first. We're we're fourth, um, and we only spend about uh, I think it's fifteen hundred dollars a pupil. Uh, transportation costs, we're, we're kind of right in the middle there. So even though we have the second highest percentage of private and parochial school students uh, in our population, and we are, it's a good thing to be second to TE in this case because they have more. About 25% of our students are go to private and parochial schools, whereas about a third of those go to private and parochial schools. And Which about, is crazy because they're ranked like really high. It's, I'm it's just saying, I'm crazy. just saying there's, it's crazy. There's, they have money and they, as you get closer to Philly and the higher end private schools, you know, Radnor has more students going to private parochial schools than TE. Lower Marion has the most students going to private parochial schools than uh, probably any school district in the, in the state. Now I'm not talking about charter schools because 
probably Coatesville and Avangrove win that that battle. Uh, Chester, yeah, Chester would win that battle. So this is just a, uh, a, a thing that shows. So of our 100 school schools that we bus to, uh, and you know we only have six here, so um, we do a pretty good job. I think we do a pretty good job. And then just to review, we need to bus to 10 miles outside of our boundaries, and we have crazy boundaries. Right, so if you lived in the northernmost part of Charlestown, let's say you lived up by the former Stables Bar, you could go to Cardinal O'Hara, and, and we'd have to bus you. Now, what people don't realize is there are no time constraints for busing except in special education. So we can put you on a bus for a, a while because there's a lot of schools in rural Pennsylvania which, which do. Now, if, if we cut busing, which we are not planning on doing, but if we did, would that be something that we would have to cover anyway? No, yeah. no. Okay. Uh, it, it's the rationale behind when the kindergarten busing was cut, we were able to actually double cut that because the we, we were busing to just as many, if not more, schools for uh, kindergarten at noontime. It's also the reason why in 91, when we cut the activity buses, which we spent a lot more money busing to private and parochial schools for activity buses, because any school that we bus to of the 100, well, the 96 or 94, if they have an activity and want a bus, we would have to send one bus down there every day for one kid if that's all it took, and we did do I that. had no idea. Oh, absolutely. It's, that was one of these, when the board had the budget issue in 91 with Willard Rouse not paying his, more, or his tax bills, um, that was the first thing the board cut. We actually did a, because um, there was a big uproar from parents, oh my God, it's gonna be awful. So we promised them, Bill Fitzpatrick at the time promised them, and for the next two years we did an analysis, the percentage of students that participated in after school and evening activities, including sports. The percentage actually went up. Our enrollment was going down at the time, but the percentage of participation went up for the next two years. So then we stopped doing that, um, and it's just been a, a uh, common place. We used to have a four o'clock bus and a 5.30 bus. So the only way around that is if parents did a private bus, then obviously that would They'd be They'd have to thing. do it all on their own. We could not do yep. it. We couldn't. I'm just, just they, so the information goes out there, that's the only way that it really would be possible, because with this budget in this times, we cannot be busing people. At the time, we were spending like $900,000 on after school and evening buses. So imagine that 27 years later. So just saying. Um, this is the debt per pupil. You can see we're first. We'll, we'll drop a little bit next year on that. Um, so I'm not sure. Kenneth must have had a bond issue or something that rolled in. They must have paid it in general fund um, for them to be that substantially high um, for that year. So here's some demographic info, and I'll let uh, the boss talk about some of these. We have shared this uh, previously. This is the change in our enrollment, the change in professional staff, number of retirements, our numbers. These, this slide deals with numbers in each of the um, subgroups. So you can see our special education numbers, numbers of students with gifted support, numbers of students with 504s. And just as a reminder, um, 504 is under Chapter 15, and that's typically related to health issues or access. Um, so m much of the time for our 504s, our nurses are very involved in those. Special education is Chapter 14, and that is, we've talked a lot about that, that's under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act federally, and uh, Chapter 14 in Pennsylvania. Gifted is Chapter 16 in Pennsylvania, and we've had um, much talk about that, as if you could remember last year, we had a large group that was started, a page group, Pennsylvania Association of Gifted Education, started as a, in Chester County with some of our parents who were very concerned. Um, our population in Gifted has grown. And then our English language learners um, population, and you can see that's grown over time. As we talk about how our demographic is changing, you'll see that a little more. As to why. And just a clarifying question on this slide, you could have a student who is ELL 
who's also gifted, who's also in special education. Absolutely. This so is this not is, you don't add up these numbers, they no. are like a Venn diagram, right. basically. These are not unique qualifiers. These are the number of students who receive the services under that chapter. And is 504 a subset of special education or completely no. separate? Okay, if a child to... has a 504 service agreement, they, if the child has a special education, an IEP, that would encompass all of the accommodations that would be under a 504. So that is the only, those are the only two that would not be combined. But are 504 costs in the special ed budget or are they in the regular budget? Regular education budget. But and all of these categories, the special ed gifted 504s and ELLs have mandated services. Yes built into them that yes. must be provided once they're identified. When the legislation talks about unfunded mandates, and we will, when Joanna presents, when Dr. Wexler presents on the um, special education budget, when the federal government, they had proposed, um, some say committed to providing 40% of costs, and we'll show with, share with you um, the disparity in that promise or proposal and the reality of the situation. So the funding that is provided for those services is nowhere near what the proposed um, per, uh, per, uh, percentage was. Regina, what else is in special, in the number of children in special education other than gifted in 504? Okay, the only thing in special education is special education. Okay. They're all unique qualifiers. So in order to receive services for special education, a child, it's a two-prong requirement. One, they have to have a disability as one of the 14 that are identified. And they have to require, um, through data, to need specially designed instruction in order to make meaningful educational progress. So for a child to qualify for special education services, those two prongs have to be met. If they qualify for special education, the only thing that's included in that special education budget are the services that go above and beyond regular education. So do all of the student population in special education have IEPs? Yes. Okay, thank you. All of those that are identified there, the 374 have GIEPs. All those, the 317 and 504s have chapter 15 or 504 service agreements. And all of the students that are identified, the 236 English language learners, they have an assessment that's done through WIDA to determine their level of, of need for English proficiency. And they have a provider by um, mandate, by law. On the next slide, you'll see the demographic comparison to other schools. We had shared to other school districts. We had shared. Um, demographics and talked about difference in cost per pupil. You'll see our enrollment numbers are there. Special education percentages. So that doesn't mean we have more students with disabilities in Great Valley than they have in Westchester or Downingtown because it's a percentage of the enrollment. So our percentage of students with disabilities or those who qualify for an IEP is 17.8% which is the highest of the other comparative districts. We are highest in population of students receiving English language learner services. We are highest in those students who are economically or identified as economically disadvantaged. That qualification, that percentage comes from those students who qualify for free and reduced lunch. That's where that number comes from. Our gifted population, um, our percentage is also there comparative to other districts. And just to be clear, like this is the percentage that's identified. Absolutely. So like another district may have just as many special ed kids in there, but they may have not done as good of a job identifying and getting services for them. Absolutely. Um, there could be, and the opposite is also true. We could have students who qualify for special education and that student may not, um, there may be people that believe that they are um, but there's no de identified without need. Right, there's an element of subjectivity when, when these assessments are done, it's not always black and white. Right, with, with well, it's, and it's done by an evaluation process and there are guidelines to determine that. Um, 
But didn't you say at one point, once a student has an IEP, they have an IEP until their parents agree to discontinue, like the school can't, can the, the school can't discontinue an IEP or 504, or can we discontinue an IEP or 504? There is, including myself, um, there, the IEP accommodations or specially designed instruction are dependent upon the IEP team, which is made up of the regular education teacher, the special education teacher, the parent or family member for a child who's 14 or older, the child, and the LEA, or you, typically the administrator. So that team comes together and those decisions that are made by the IEP team go into the document that drives what is required for that child. So. Um, it doesn't ever go away. <laughs> the goal is to have children exit special education because once they no longer need specially, specialized, um, specially, specially designed instruction, they shouldn't need a plan. So that's the goal to have students exit special education. If you level the playing field, um, and I'm not only talking about Great Valley across the Commonwealth, no. that doesn't happen very frequently. That that's my I'm so sorry. That that's what I was getting to is that very often because the parent the whole the team has to agree, right? So if the parents Absolutely. do not agree that the once the IEP has been identified that their child no longer needs an IEP, then they then the that, team has to agree. Yes. So that's what I'm trying to get, and I'm not saying it well. Yeah. And I'm not trying to say that <laughs> students should be thrown out of their IEPs. I'm just trying to understand the right. dynamic there. Um, what you'll oftentimes see in the gifted population as students uh, matriculate <laughs> through our courses, we offer a lot of highly rigorous courses and a lot of choice at the high school with our AP offerings and our dual enrollment offerings. So as children um, transition to high school, oftentimes they will find the high school curriculum rigorous enough so they don't need something more to enrich their academic uh, portfolio so they'll opt out of or exit gifted services, gifted supports. Moving on. And I will add that in the special education numbers, there are several categories of special education students, which I believe Joanna will talk about next month. They go from the most severe needs, which could cost us well in the deep six figures each, to the most common, which I, I'll call like learning support, or maybe they need some, some minor help. Uh, that's the biggest chunk, and there are a couple, couple in between there. Um, what the state does, they'll tier them. And the reason they tier them, the level of support financially, is because there's, um, and it doesn't happen every year, but frequently, the state will come out with contingency funding, meaning if, if the cost to educated child goes significantly above that which um, the cost is for a, a child with, in regular education, they will provide 2% of the overage back, which seems insignificant, but 2% is better than nothing. And we are very good at making sure that we take advantage of every opportunity to get any money back. So we do that contingency funding, which is um, laborious, but 2% is 2% and 2% of a lot is even better. Um, and access funding, access billing, which is where we can get 50 cents back on the dollar for certain programs and certain services that we provide. And I have to do a major shout out to um, our uh, access billing person, Donna Jerome, who um, makes sure that every bubble is bubbled in. And she has actually, we have our Patriot Pride Awards. And on one of the cards, a parent actually wrote how thankful they were. She drove the parent to the courthouse in Westchester to make sure that her paperwork was validated in order for the child to get the services they need and for the district to get the the access m billing money. So um, we are working on not only cutting, but actually maximizing benefit back, so increasing revenue as well. Just a couple charts you've seen before. Here's, here's uh, it's, this is our total teaching staff. I put it this way. It's kind of the way they have it in Forecast 5, but it's us versus Downingtown, TE, and Unionville, and Westchester as far as the number of students per staff that we have. So we are first here. We have the most teachers, uh, we, have, we have the least students per staff as at 11.21. This is last year's number, the end of 2017. It's the most recent PIMS number we have. Um, 
So that number will probably actually rise a little bit, even though our staffing went up because our, our students went up more. Um, and this slide is a little difficult, so because at first blush you look at the orange and think high is the high is the number of students. Yes. Yeah, so so if you look at the number of students, that's the orange bar. The dot shows how many students well, actually, are the, aligned to each teacher. So yeah, that's I hate the correct you, but the. Uh, the orange is the number of teachers that are employed. Right. So Downingtown is the highest because they have they're the biggest district. They have the most teachers. The little dot goes with the right hand side axis in, and it's a percentage or it's a number. It's a per ratio. ratio. It's the it's the uh, yeah, right. Number of students per student teacher. Student-staff ratio. That's where student the dot staff. falls. So for, for every student we have in the school district, or for every staff member we have in the school district, there's only 11.2 students. So, um, This one just shows regular education. So I, I showed the, <laughs> I'll show the next one. So this is regular education. So this is just the teachers, not special ed teachers, not nurses, not guidance, not social workers, not uh, whatever else doesn't get charged here. Psychologists aren't mm -hmm. in that because they're not in that. So this is this shows the by school. So this is just the secondary schools because if I had shown all the schools, it wouldn't have fit on it's here. It's so tiny. Uh, so it has all the high schools in the five districts I previously showed and, and all the middle schools. Um, actually, ironically, um, the... Um, Fugit has the lowest students per staff. This is a chart. Um, Got to take a second to explain. It's three charts in one. Um, it's awesome. So the first section of the chart there, multicolored, we are, we are the top blue there, is that what they call the number of FTEs. That's a full-time equivalent number of teachers. So you can see that our full-time equivalent number of teachers, um, we're about even with uh, Unionville and Avangrove and Phoenixville and Cloak drop down to, to, to Kennett. And TE has more because they've, they've got more kids. The, the average in the county, and really the average is thrown with uh, Westchester and Downingtown having so many kids, is, is like 458. Ours is, on this chart is, I believe, just under 337. It's the uh, last year's numbers. The middle, the middle uh, chart is a bar that shows the students per full-time equivalent teacher. So as you can see, um, while we were the lowest of the ones we showed, you can see we're not that, that awful low. And actually, if I had put Phoenixville on the chart before, they actually have, have, have less students per teacher than we do. Uh, with less population. Uh, but you can see the, the students, you see TE is higher than us. Avon Grove has the most uh, students per teacher. And then on the right side is the, um, is the average teacher salary last year. So we are number one with a bullet there, uh, with TE being second, Unionville being third, uh, and uh, Actually, Avon Grove being fourth in that category. The average teacher salary in the county is 71,000. Ours is closer to 86,000, I think. I should have put, couldn't figure out how to have forecast five put the numbers on there, but there would have been a lot of numbers if I'd done it. So, um, just a, another chart there. And just, then this, out, just out of curiosity, do other school districts have the same recommended class sizes? Because it would seem like that would be one way that the numbers could be very easily influenced if, for example, if if one school had a you know recommended class size of no more than 40 people at the high school and ours is lower. Do we know if, if we're all in line? Many school districts don't have a class size guideline. But class size doesn't matter so much if you have under, under if you have an underutilized classroom with four, five, six kids in it. Yeah, right. <laughs> It doesn't matter if you have 26 kids. And, and as Regina them. said, that I, most of our numbers are being skewed by the high school, middle school's classes being a little lower than, if, you know, if you recall, we shared the chart with the high school and middle school and uh, comparing to our neighboring districts. And, and we're, we're actually 
there, there are a lot of classes there that, as you said, we started this year looking at some of those class sizes. You know, everybody thought we cut the budget. We did not cut the budget. We added to the budget, but, uh, but you know, some of the classes were combined and will continue to be mm -hmm. so next year. I mean, it's going to be, people are going to, you know, it's going to, we're going to get closer to the class size guidelines as prescribed for the high school and middle school. That, that's the only way, that is the only way to cut the butt or to, that's your discretion in the Well, that's, that's exactly what I'm trying to get at is that and these numbers be will careful. look different if we have larger classes. And, and just, just so you know, you know, it's happened in the past with, with boards in the past, not too long ago, somebody comes and complains because they're not getting XYZ course at the high school for a ninth grader basic because it's down to, to 12 and we cut it and then we have to put it back in. That cost you like two tenths of two, two fifths of a, or two tenths of a teacher. It cost you one fifth of a teacher, which is a lot. And, you know, so that's. And if you remember, we had that conversation here in October because there was a lot of talk that due to budget cuts, class sizes at the high school increased. It had absolutely nothing to do with budget cuts. It had to do with working within our class size guidelines. <coughs> and um, it was different, and it felt different, and folks had shared that. This is a, a, a dashboard that we like to look at. It's kind of everything at once here. Um, shows our uh, top left, the top left, the orange, is our what the history of our, our low income population. And you can see we were at 7% in 2011, and we are just about double that now. Um, right below that is, is district live births compared to uh, who actually shows up in kindergarten. Um, the next one is our, is the school level, it's more of a drill down of that low income chart, but it's by school. So each chart there, the green bar is the population in each school. So obviously the biggest bar there is the high school. And then at the bottom there, you can see if you can, it's pretty hard to see, um, but you can blow it up on your screen at some point, um, is the percent low income. So again, the right axis is the percentages, the left axis is the number of students. Now up in the top right is, is the trend in our, in our ethnicity. Now you'll note, I'll go over this in a second, but you, I have another slide on this one. But uh, you'll note there's a gap in 2017 ethnicity. And what happens is if you have a, a uh, grade level with less than 10 students in it, PDE will report it as an asterisk in the database, which then throws off the entire ethnic um, total. So we actually had forecast five. I'll show it's on the next slide. I'll show you that we had forecast five put the right number in because it's it's our Asian population. But you can see how in 2010, and I'll go over this one on the next slide. It's a little easier to, to read. And then we have our grade level. This is each, the bottom chart there is our grade level disbursement. So it's each grade and how many kids we had in it last year. This is the, the race and ethnicity chart that I was talking about. We actually had them, we used, we got the numbers and force fit that in. So you can see how in 2010, we had 83, a little over 83% um, uh, Caucasian white, 10.4% Asian, and 3.1% uh, Hispanic. And I'll just pick one, you know, every other one there. In 2017, this is last year. We don't have this year's numbers yet. This was last year's number. Um, we're at 60, just under 69% uh, Caucasian, almost 17% uh, Asian, and we've we're up to eight, almost 9% in uh, Hispanic. So you can see, you know, our, our diversity continues to grow. Um, and uh, one of the reasons we keep track of this is because we have to make sure that we're, we're being able to respond to the changing demographic. And that's why we look very much at the categories that we had shared um, with services that are provided. And right now, when you look at our race and ethnicity enrollment trends, 
We currently have for our ELL population um, in excess of 90 different languages represented that we are supporting students in learning of the English language. So as that changes, we want to make sure that we're in a, in a position to respond to that and again be proactive in, in that response to minimize the amount of time that services are necessary, both for the ch benefit of the child as well as the financial investment in the district. And that's it. Anything else that you wanted to see, we'll bring back next week or March. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, on here you had uh, some agreements for review. Yes. Uh, a contract for independent psychologists, as uh, Mr. Smith talked about earlier, couple professional development contract, acceptance of donation. Our official letter from PBE stating that we have to stay within the index. Uh, and what did we see here? So, Chuck, we get that letter because we voted to stay within the index. Is yeah, that why? The budget is worthless that we sent. All right, thank you. Any other items? Right, I just had one. I just wanted to reiterate uh, the school board has started negotiating with the uh, teachers union. Their contract expires. June 30th this year, um, per state code, uh, negotiations started in January, official negotiations. Uh, the board is using Jeff Sultanic as our primary negotiator, and he is working with our guidance uh, to work on a contract with them. Um, Ryan is not participating in any of the negotiation discussions, uh, as his wife is a teacher in the school district and it is to his and her best interest that uh, both of them are not involved or he's not involved at all in any of the discussions or decisions that are being made relating to that contract. So more hopefully to come in the future. Um, let's see, we also met an executive session beforehand for some personnel and legal issues and just for the record. Uh, Mary had a business engagement, and Samantha had a death in the family, so that's why the two of them are not here tonight. All right. Any committee reports? I know Mary's got a legislative report she'll do next week. Also, the IU meets um, next week, but I will do the previous um, months. I will do January's meeting um, next week. Being, uh, there's going to be a lag with that, Dave. I think Carol, we had the same problem with Carol because of when they meet and when we meet. So I will actually always be a month behind with that. No problem. As long as we get the updates and you keep us informed, all that important stuff over there. All right. Um, also, there's the draft agenda for next week. And the meeting, just for a reminder, everybody, is Tuesday night. Not Monday, because Monday is uh, President's Day and the schools will be closed in recognition of the holiday. And yes. school will be open on Friday due to a snow day. Yeah, thank you. Um, facilities and instructional technology meet tomorrow evening. And I believe it's at 6 o'clock here in the district office. And those meetings go on uh, simultaneously, just so you're aware. All right. Any other items? All right, I'll open up the podium for any public comment. Um, if you comment, state your name and residency, and please try to limit your time to three minutes. It would be appreciated. Thank you. My name is Amanda Snyder, and I'm uh, a parent of a child at Sugarton Elementary. 
and at the Great Valley Middle School. And the first thing I just want to say, I have uh, two kids with IEPs, and I just want, I want you to realize, I realize your, your job is to figure out all this financial stuff, but these teams are just doing a phenomenal job. And you have to know that, that the money is not just money to me, that it's the possibility that my son is going to live to be a successful adult one day. So, and that he's not going to be dependent on the community. And so it's the people that are going above and beyond in, in the schools are really phenomenal. And I don't know if a lot of special ed parents come up here and say that. Because <laughs> we do tend to bark and complain a lot because we're advocating for our kids. Um, but I also work in special ed in Montgomery County. And I know when people are working hard when I see it. And I appreciate it. So my issue tonight is Sugartown. I met with Regina and... The gym at Sugartown is a hot box. Um, years ago, I believe when it was built, they did not put on cooling because there was some sort of grant, an environmental grant um, that they were getting approved for. And I believe the year that it was put in, a little girl passed out during an assembly. <laughs> it's hot in there. Um, General Wayne, has a similar issue that they, they have a gym that is not cooled, but they have exhaust fans in the windows. And there's, a, a, there's another student there that has heating, that has issues. My son has um, a genetic disorder where he does not, his sweat glands don't work. So he can't go to gym if it's too hot. He can't go to an assembly if it's too hot. Mr. Hammond and Regina have gone above and beyond to rework uh, the schedule and to make it work for him so that he doesn't miss gym class um, and that he doesn't miss assemblies, but it is impossible to do that 100%. There, and I have a couple parents here from Sugartown that are on board with me, and I have a petition that I had parents sign that we need to do something about this gym. It violates the American Disabilities Act and Section 504 for people coming to these assemblies, staff, kids, anybody with medical issues, epilepsy, diabetes, my son has a rare disorder, which I'm sure no one else in the district, maybe there's one or two that would have it. But this affects anyone who wants to come see it. And I have offered to even fundraise for these exhaust fans, which originally I suggested some kind of ceiling fan, but I'm not an engineer, I'm a social worker for special ed. And I don't know what works to cool the area, but I do know that General Wayne has these exhaust fans that seem to be doing the job because the parent of the little girl that has this heat issue has not come, had, a, had an issue. So I understand you're concerned about finances. We're willing, we have a community that's willing to fundraise for this. We think that our exhaust fans will do the job. And I know the facilities committee is meeting tomorrow and I'd really like you to approve it. And I have been trying to work on this for a couple of years. <laughs> so I believe, I, is that everything? <laughs> oh, thanks. Come on up. Yeah, hi. I'm uh, Suzanne Clancy. I have a student at Sugartown also and a student in the middle school. And um, I feel like all of Amanda's statements were absolutely true. And I just wanted to also add in that for the parents and the community members and the other students when they go to events that take place in the gymnasium at Sugartown, um, if it's any time when the weather is warm, which, you know, during the spring, we had a lot of end of year kind of festivals and events, including, I'm just going to talk about the Lego fair because that's one that I, have, I attended because uh, my daughter was um, participating. And my daughter actually asked if she could come tonight to speak to you because she knew what we were talking about. And she said, my friends and I worked for two months on these Lego projects, and we really wanted our parents to see these. And everybody, the volunteers, the parents, the kids were all sweating so badly. And about 15 minutes into the event, 
nobody was in the gym. Everybody was out on the playground because it was so hot. Nobody, except the volunteers were, were standing in there sweating because they felt like they had to be. But I just feel like everybody was saying, what a shame it is that nobody's in here looking at these Lego exhibits because it's so hot. And it's just, you know, whether it's the Lego fair or the shows and concerts that take place at night when all the families are packed in there, it's just too hot. And, and I hope you'll at least consider looking into a solution. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce Chambers, 17 James Thomas Road, Malvern. Got you the address. Um, thank you very much for the discussion tonight. It was very nice to see that. It brought back some bad memories and some good memories for myself. Um, I really appreciate you taking to heart some of the things that uh, I've sent you. I'm not saying that out of pride. I really appreciate the fact that you're, you're discussing those. Um, I would agree with uh, something that Ellen said. Um, and I think it's something that you need to define better as a, as a school board. She kept harping on, what are, we, what are we doing to stay number 10, I think it was, right? Or better. Or better. Well, that should be your goal. And you have to make that goal, and I've said this before, you have to make that goal an objective that you can measure. Once you've identified the goal, then you can identify where you're going to put the resources to meet that goal. It's not a matter of looking at what you have now and saying, what do we, what, what do we not need anymore? You heard what we have a need here. But what is the goal for the school district? And I, I don't see that you've defined that. So it's very hard as a board to look at anything and decide where do we need to put the money if you don't know what you're, what you're going for. You're looking at it from the standpoint of run, we're running a school district, everything we're doing we have to do, but Ellen has a goal. We need to be 10 or better. How do you get there and how do you spend the money to get to that point? That's the big overarching thing you've got to do as a school board. Right now, it's probably a little too late for this year or, or for the budget for next year. But Phil was correct about the personnel costs. It's all personnel. It's 70 something percent of your costs is personnel. All that is driven by your teacher's contract. You'd be surprised how much money you can save by just tweaking that teacher's contract just a little bit. And I have some experience that Phil and I did. I spent a lot of time with Mr. Linderman. It's not that hard if the teachers can come to agree to cut just some of the benefits. You can save a million dollars with just a stroke of the pen. It's not that hard. So that would be something you need to look at. The other thing is managing what you currently have. Your other personnel, how many of the other personnel do you need? In 2010, 2011, when we had the um, Great Recession, the school board made a lot of cuts in people. We cut a bunch of positions. And we got the union to freeze the contract. We cut a bunch of positions that had no effect on the status of the, of the Great Valley School District. I'm not saying you need to cut positions, but can you cut the pay? Can you cut the benefits that you give everybody else? It's things like that. You could manage your resources a little bit better to save money here, save money there, and maybe come up with several million dollars. I'll remind you that a million dollars is only 1%, less than 1% of what, you, what the superintendent's proposed to you. That's not a lot of money. Uh, another, the last suggestion I'll give you is um, uh, you may have to, as a board, just say, here's your, here's your budget. Hundred, hundred million dollars, that's all you're going to get. Tell us how you can use the money that you have to meet the goals of the school district. Your goals aren't clear, but you can still do that as a board, and I think that's what, what it's going to come down to. I don't think one or two million dollars off is enough. I mean, you've spent increased spending by 30 million in the last six years. I've, I'm not going to go over that. I was going to go over all the stuff I sent you in the emails. I won't do that. Uh, you, you saw the figures I gave you there. They're astronomical. Um, so there's a lot that you could do to manage the costs you currently have, manage the personnel better, set goals that you can measure, and so that you can you can then put your put your resources out there to meet those goals. And lastly, uh, Steph said that she'd like to see me do something. I don't know that I'd like to do that. But um, I, would, I would volunteer to uh, help the board in any way. I have some experience in this stuff. 
and I'd be willing to do that at no charge. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? All right. Thank you very much for coming. Have a good evening, and we will see you next Tuesday. Thank you. Oh.